Today's lecture is fairly routine to start with about English consonants. Remember I told you about the classification of consonants and we conventionally classify them in terms of voicing, place and manner. So this morning we're going to look at place and then at voicing. Now, you can approach this in two ways. One is to say this is something you've all got to learn because you must know the classification. And that's rather boring. The other is to say that it tells you a lot of useful information which you can put to good use. So there is that uh, table which is on your handout and which you have seen elsewhere going through the different places of articulation for the English consonant. Generally speaking, it's obvious what's happening at the front of the mouth. We are aware of the activities of the lips and the uh, tip of the tongue and so on. But we're less and less aware of what's going on as we move backwards in the mouth. Because we can't see what's happening, we can't really feel so easily what's happening. So part of this you have to take on trust or by looking at x-ray pictures or diagrams based on them. Uh, more fun than uh, going through the labels though, just on their own, is to see how they apply to words. Here are some consonants in the middles of words. And so if you'd like just to say them with me and feel the bilabial, the two lips action for happy, happy. happy. and hobby. Hobby. But then the tongue tip on the alveolar ridge, making alveolar consonants, voiceless plosive city, city. city. voiced ready. ready. Velar consonants made with the back of the tongue, articulating with the soft palate or velum. Lucky. 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 Sugar. 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 And then we have the affricates, which we call palato-alveolar, some books say post-alveolar, which involves a more complex articulation. Nature. Nature. Magic. Magic. Then some fricatives. Labiodental, that's the lower lip and the upper teeth. Which of them moves? Some people say you have to move your upper teeth to bring them into contact with the lips. Why is that difficult? Because your upper teeth are fixed to your cranium, to your skull. So you have to move the lip, the lower lip. Voiceless suffer. Suffer. And voiced river. River. Dental fricatives, the TH sounds, tongue sort of spread out, touching the teeth, not necessarily pushing out between them, but against the teeth. Author. 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 Father. 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 Okay, and then alveolar fricatives, most people have no problems with the voiceless one. I see. I see. And the voiced one, easy. Easy. Some people have problems doing it before E type vowels, Japanese, for example. Then the the palatal alveolar fricatives, somewhat retracted tongue, voiceless nation, nation, voiced measure. 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 Okay, there are some pictures of some of these places of articulation from a book, and if you study them for the D, you can see the two lips in contact, as against the F, where it's the lip and teeth, dental fricatives, tongue laid against the back of the upper teeth, the alveolar place for T somewhat further back in English. Of course, many languages make T, D, N and so on dental. In English, we don't normally. We make them alveolar. So if you're a speaker of a language with dental Ts, Russian, Italian, French, Spanish, note the difference. Picture of SH there. What matters with SH probably is getting the right auditory effect rather than worrying too much about the exact articulatory configuration. Let's just do a little practice with sh. Notice how the resonance can vary as I do this. Shh. Try and do that. Notice how you can get different resonances. Uh, in Japanese, for example, sh is fairly high pitched. English is a bit lower. Partly you get this by pushing the lips forward a bit, partly by retracting the tongue. English, 
On the other hand, if you speak Russian, that's very dark compared with English. So we have to make it more palatable. So aim at a fairly middle sort of one for English. Though I admit in English it sometimes varies according to the following vowel. So when we have sheep and when we have shoe or shawl, you may get somewhat different resonance qualities. And there's a picture from Kirk, which on the whole is not problematic. Here are some more <coughs> consonants between vowels. These are the sonorant consonants, the nasals, liquids, semi-vowels, bilabial nasal, hammer, hammer. hammer. alveolar honey, velar honey. singer. Yeah. Okay, distinguish those three carefully. Uh, R and L, English R, typically an approximant with the air coming over the centre of the tongue, tongue tip somewhat raised. Sorry. 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 People often ask, can we use the pronunciation sorry, which is Spanish type R, Greek type R. Well, this used to be quite common between vowels, but now it's very definitely regional. It's associated with certain North of England regional accents, Liverpool, Scouse, or Nottingham, or whatever. Mainstream English, English, British English has an approximate, the same as in red. What we do have increasingly in English is lip activity with this, though. Whether I should encourage you to imitate this, I'm not sure, but you'll certainly notice native speakers articulating with their lips as they say, sorry. Red and so on, or even solid and red. Be aware of that. The L, on the other hand, the lateral, so called because the air escapes laterally, that's on one side or the other, because the tongue tip in the middle is in contact. So follow, 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 follow. Two semi vowels, E, kind of semi vowel like a vowel, E, but quick, beyond. beyond. And W, like an O, that is articulated with the back of the tongue and with the lips rounded, like an O vowel, so away. 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 Okay, so much for place of articulation. The only one I haven't mentioned on screen is the last line, the glottal place of articulation, which is where we have our friend the glottal stop we talked about yesterday. I uh, uh, just practice practice doing a glottal stop between vowels. Okay. That is the same base of articulation as we conventionally associate with the H consonant, which of course is just voiceless air escaping, and it tends to be like a voiceless vowel. <coughs> Hat. Get ready for A. Uh, but then say voicelessness to begin with, hat, 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 hair, and so on. Well, if you have problems with that, you know about it. Two kinds of problems. First of all, not being able to do it at all, or uncertain between the difference between a glottal stop and an H, typical French problem, Italian problem, or making it too strong and perhaps velar or uvula, hat, <coughs> Russian, and so on. All the remaining obstructs in English come in pairs by voicing. The sonorants are all normally voiced. So we have to look at this matter of voicing. And again, I think it's helpful to do practical things when you're teaching people about this, teach them to do it to control the contrast between voiceless and voiced. What we have to do is to make a sequence of sounds like s, 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 that's s and z, alternating between Now, to do this, and to perceive voicing, there are various techniques available. One is you can place your thumb and forefinger on your larynx. Do that and see if you can say aloud can you feel the vibration? Even more dramatic is to cover your ears with your hands and then do the same thing. 
You should be able to hear loud buzzing in your head as you do the voice one. Now, it's no use being a shrinking violet and say, <laughs> you have to do it loudly, confidently, like that. Try that, or you can do it with F and V. Or you can try it with the TH sounds, voiceless and voiced. Every time you put the voicing on, you should hear that buzzing. When you switch the voicing off again, there should be no sound. So this is a way yourself of testing what you're doing. Uh, there are straightforward ways to do this too with instrumental methods, with a microphone and a computer, which I'm not going to show you today, but which is very easy to do, where you will see the uh, resultant change in the speech waveform, depending on whether voice is present or not. So, we have voiceless fricatives. Just make all those and make them voiceless. Four bases of friction. The Plosives, of course, we can't really hear during the crucial phase, which is the hold. If I say happy, the essential bit is the, but you can't hear, happy. Try and sort of prolong it like that, happy, happy, and check that it's voiceless. Happy, 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 happy. And likewise with the term, church. If you say church, you get buzzing during the er, uh, but not before an uh. Try that. Church. 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 What you have to aim at is to give the learners control over what they're doing, so that they know what they're doing. And once you have understood this technique, you are in command. You can switch the voicing on or off when you need it. It gives you control. Voice sounds, well, if we take a b between vowels, as in rubber, you should hear the voicing going right through. Rubber. <laughs> or a ladder. 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 Judging. 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 And likewise with the voiceless fricatives, very easy, so mm, river, 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 busy, busy, busy. So if you have, if you're a speaker, say, of Spanish, and you might tend to say busy, well, here's what you must do. Busy, practice saying it, making the voice and go right through. Busy, busy, busy. Nasals. Their voices. Money. 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 Morning. 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 And so are the liquids. Relevant. And so Now, all of these consonants in English, as we know, except H, can occur at the end of a word, or generally at the end of a syllable. And we know that for some learners, this <coughs> constitutes a problem. What we have to concentrate on is getting the consonant started. Don't worry about finishing it, but starting it within the same syllable. So let's try these. It just goes through all the various different fricatives and affricates and then some more. Let's try rough. Rough. Love. Love. Death. Death. Smooth. 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 Face. Cheese, cheese, push, 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 or keen, we notice an interesting phenomenon. I'm just preparing my high-tech demonstration. <laughs> when I say pen, pen, do you 
notice the paper blows away. <laughs> now, if I were a speaker of Spanish, I might say, Ben. 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 <laughs> In English, we say, Ben. This is aspiration, which is because the separation of the articulators is followed by a brief period of voicelessness, during which the articulators have separated, but the vocal folds are still apart. So the air, expelled by the lungs, surges out. In Spanish, immediately you separate the lips, the vocal folds start vibrating. In English, they don't. This is not a problem for Japanese, but it is a problem for speakers of French, Spanish, and various other languages. So this is, in fact, the main way in which a pair like pan and ban is distinguished in English. That presence or absence of aspiration, town and down, tongue and gun. Aspiration on the voiceless one, but not on the voiced one. In fact, we have a contrast of voicing at the beginnings of words, in the middles of words, and at the ends of words. And depending on your own first language or your pupil's first language, any of these three may constitute a particular problem. Aspiration is the problem in the beginning. Uh, most people are okay in the middle for most of the pairs, though Finns or Danes or whatever may have problems there. At the end, some languages neutralize voicing contrasts, so not only Germans, Russians, Poles, but also uh, Koreans, for example, have problems with cap versus cab sometimes. There are some pairs for practicing in the middle. A simple symbol. E versus B, a simple symbol. Simple symbol. Danish mispronunciation is simple symbol. <laughs> and uh, another pair, <coughs> happy people, voiceless P's in the middle. Happy people, Danish problem is heavy people. <laughs> That's not quite right in English. Aspiration, an aspirated plosive is one followed by a little H sound, yes. A delay as we've seen between the release of the primary closure of the articulators and the beginning of the sound of English PTK are aspirated at the beginning of a syllable, at least if it has a strong vowel, not necessarily before a weak vowel, as we discussed yesterday. But unaspirated if it's not at the beginning of the syllable because it's preceded by an S. But also not aspirated if it's followed by any kind of obstruent. Elsewhere, it's slightly aspirated, conventionally called unaspirated. So that rule is on your handout. Let's have a look at some <coughs> instrumental tracings. This is from Ladifoget's book, Vowels and Consonants. At the top you see the waveforms for the Spanish words besos and pesos. The dotted vertical line represents the moment at which the lips separate. Time is coming along here, from, right to the, from left to right. So, can you see that during the actual B in Spanish, there is a voicing indication, even before the release? Then immediately upon release, of course, we have a much bigger movement of the wave, besos. In the case of pesos, the second one, we've got no vibration during the hold. It starts at the dotted line, pesos. Now compare that with English. This is the English word bases and paces. In English, bases, that's a B, but the vibration doesn't actually start, really, until about the release. The B is typically de-voiced, as we say. We don't say, in English, bad, bases. We say, bad, bases. So there's really little or no uh, vibration of the vocal folds during the whole of the closing. Last line, though, where we have the word paces, not only is there no vibration during the hold, but there's this gap of aspiration after the release, after the dotted line, 
before the vibration from bow. Pace, slowing it down, paces, paces, normal speed, paces, paces, paces. This means that English B sounds rather like a Spanish P. Confusing. And it means that we tend to miss here Spanish, Spanish speakers tend to miss here English, and we each have problems pronouncing the other person's language. If you ask me what's the Spanish for pesos, Mexican currency, I say it in English as pesos. Pesos. And it sounds rather different from what I hope is correct Spanish, pesos. <laughs> and conversely, if you apply Spanish habits in English. Have we got any speakers of Thai here? Don't think so. No. Well, Thai is an interesting language because Thai has a three-way contrast. You have voiced B, you have voiceless, unaspirated P, and you have voiceless, aspirated P. So here we have three Thai words which sound more or less like ba, meaning crazy, ba, meaning aunt, and pa, meaning cloth, where the first one is fully voiced, ba. The second one is voiceless but unaspirated, ba. And the third one is voiceless and aspirated, pa. I'm not very good on Thai tones, but as far as I remember, that's more or less what they're like. <coughs> and there are other languages, uh, Hindi and various Indian languages that have not three, but four consonants distinguished by a complex of voicing and aspiration. So really what we're dealing with is a kind of continuum of possibilities. If we consider the relative timing of the release of the primary closure and the onset of voicing, the start of voicing, we can have a continuum of possibilities. At the top, we've got a long, long gap before the voicing starts. Schematically there at the top, we've got pa. Then a less extreme aspiration, pa. Then a bit of aspiration, pa. Then no aspiration, pa. Then a bit of voicing, ba. Then a lot of voicing, ba. Then pre-voicing, a ba. And languages, you know, are spread out along this continuum. And depending where your language is, you may have to make adjustments up or down if you're to sound like a native speaker of the other language. This is something that our MA phonetics students have to learn to do to control this so that we can do voicing in the way that other languages do it. More pictures from Nanophobit. At the top we've got the word tie and the word die in English. And you notice the important difference that you have the aspiration in the case of t. The noise burst is the noise produced by t, the separation of the tongue tip and the alveolar ridge. So we've got that gap in the case of tie, very small gap in the case of die, die. <coughs> what we've got at the bottom is the word sty, demonstrating that in English we don't actually say sty with aspiration. Sty, no, we say sty, sty. Which means that all the Chinese immediately say, but you're pronouncing not a T but a D. And indeed, they have a very reasonable point. From the point of view of aspiration, we have not a, an aspirated T, but an aspirated plosive, but an unaspirated plosive in sty or stand or stick. And likewise in spin or skin or school. The plosives there are unaspirated. They're not voiced, of course. We feel them in English to be kinds of PT and K, respectively, but it's very difficult to prove this among those who hear them as kinds of BD or K. In fact, there is, after S, there is a neutralization of the contrast. 
Just as we saw vowel neutralization of E and A in happy, so here we've got neutralization of P versus B. Pin and bin, yes, we have to make the difference. Spin, after S, it doesn't matter. Okay, here are some places where we have aspirated consonants for you to practice. After me, depend. Depend. Now, why is there aspiration there? It's not at the beginning of a word. No, but it is at the beginning of a syllable. syllable. Depend. And let's just check. Depend. If I say depend. No, that's not right in English. Notice how I can control aspiration. You must learn to control aspiration in the same way. Nearly 50 years ago, when I was very young and I met Daniel Jones, the founder of our department, for the first time, one of the first things he made me do to check out that I was all right was to demonstrate that I could control aspiration. He got me to read some Hindi, uh, where it's important to make this difference to see if I could do it correctly. I think I passed the test. Let's try <laughs> attack with the aspiration. Attack. 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 Okay, account. account. Now what about these next words? <coughs> Police, today, collide. Are these aspirated? No. Well, not really, because here the vowel is weak. And in these cases, I mean it doesn't matter very much, but in practice native speakers don't aspirate them as much. We don't on the whole say police or today. We say police today, today. So not so much aspiration there. What about the last cases? Approve and accuse. What happens here? Well, we've got p and k at the beginning of a stressed syllable, strong vowel therefore. So we expect aspiration. Do we get a little H sound? Mm. Aspiration isn't really a little H sound. Aspiration is a delay in the onset of voicing. Now, this means that this delay happens during the R or the yod that follows. The result is a voiceless R. Approve. Approve. Try that. Approve. 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 The aspiration takes the form of devoicing the R. Likewise, accuse, accuse, accuse. We get a little palatal fricative, really. Accuse, accuse, accuse. Really quite like a German ich that. Accuse, accuse. So that is covered in point five on our handout. If a liquid, R or L, or a semivowel, the or W, comes between the plosive and the vowel, then aspiration takes the form of making this consonant voiceless. It is. Let's do some more practice of that. Same thing. After me, praise. 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 The R is voiceless. Praise. Plot. 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 The L is voiceless. Plot. Sometimes people want to learn how to make the Welsh sound spelt double L, as in place names Llangollen and Llanellyn. So this is a good way to start. Take a word like plot or please and stop on the L. Then you just have to make it a bit stronger, a bit more forceful, and you've got the right sound. Tune. Two. Well, I missed this here, but I told you uh, yesterday that increasingly, in fact, people pronounce words like tune with a straightforward ch, as in chair, and so they say chew. So if you like, you can say chew too. The point remains that the second element, whatever it is, semivowel or fricative, is actually voiceless because of the aspiration. Chew, chew, chew. And in quick, the W is voiceless. Quick, 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 quick. Now, what about the places where we have no aspiration? After S at the beginning of a syllable. So this is where we have spin, 
to check it. Spin. 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 And it would be wrong to say spin. 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 Stand. Stand. School. 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 Scratch. Now in scratch, you can see it follows logically that the R is in principle voiced. I give you rules, I say the R is voiced. When you actually make a spectrogram or whatever, you may find that it's not 100% voiced, but the principle is correct. And likewise, the R in strong even. So because this makes an affricate, this often does get in fact voiced. Another place where we have no aspiration is at before a following obstruent, in a word like lapse. Well, this is obvious. You couldn't put a little H in there. You're certainly not going to say lapse. Lapse. No, lapse. And if we define aspiration as a delay in the onset of voicing, well, then this is meaningless because there is no onset of voicing, so we can't talk about its delay. However, if we had to classify everything as aspirated or unaspirated, then these are going to be unaspirated. Depth. Depth. Lots. Lots. Fix. Fix. And interestingly, in words like actor or captain. Now, what's happening here? Actor. We don't usually say actor, although we can. We don't usually say doctor although we can. We usually say actor and doctor. I think really this is a problem in perception rather than a problem in production. It's no great disaster if foreign learners of English say actor. It just sounds like a careful pronunciation. But what is important is that when we say actor, you hear the K there. Because it is there. Why can't you hear it? Well, because there is a kind of time overlap between the velar articulation for the K and the alveolar articulation for the T. I'm not sure if I've got a picture of this or not. No, I haven't. So, let's just think about it. You've got to make a velar closure for the K, so the back of the tongue comes up to the alveolar, to the soft palate. Now, while you hold that closure, the tongue tip comes up to the other place of contact, the alveolar ridge. And we reach a stage when we have both contacts in place. We've got the alveolar contact, we hold it. Now we can release the velar one. You can't hear that. The air's not going to escape anywhere. You have to take it on trust that it's happened. And finally, we release the tongue tip, and you hear it. So what you hear is an approach for a velar, and then a release for an alveolar. That's sufficient to identify the place of articulation of each of the consonants. In captain, you can see this happening. I say cap, lips closed. While the lips are held together, we make the T closure, alveolar, cap. When I separate my lips, cap, you don't hear any noise because there's no air pressure behind them. So not cap tin, but cap. Closure there, cap tin. And finally, you hear the T released, cap tin. So it's a matter of overlap in time between these two articulations, which makes it difficult to. Here, perhaps, and you can regard it as a lazy English way of speaking, but that's life, that's what we actually do. Okay, the remaining places in the syllable where we get pataka, uh, generally speaking, you needn't worry about their aspiration, they're slightly aspirated or unaspirated. At the end of a word, at the end of an utterance, at any rate, well, it's meaningless to discuss how much there is. Right, is it aspirated? Right, not on the whole. Right, is it unaspirated? Well, right. Often, of course, it's unreleased in the sentence. These apples are right. I don't have to open my lips at all again at the end. Practice saying right 
Right. 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 Of course, right. you've got to open your lips sometime <laughs> in your life. <laughs> But the point is, you don't have to keep the air pressure behind them. You can release the, you can stop pushing with the lungs, right? right. Very often, at the end of a word like this, the native speakers also reinforce the closure with glottal closure. So we don't say exactly right, but right. <laughs> or right. Closure there. And sometimes we do this very energetically, resulting in this sort of thing, ripe, ripe, shut, shut, look, look. Now those are called ejectives. You absolutely don't have to imitate them, but they're one of the possible articulations that you get. All kinds of glottal activity then simultaneously. For a simple final T, shut with a glottal stop is becoming more and more common. This is all very good news for speakers of Cantonese, <laughs> who have this kind of articulation in their own language. Their problem is not to do it with b, d, g, but not to say back instead of bad. But that's another question. Uh, for everybody else, the interesting question is perhaps not utterance final position, but when we have a following vowel, a ripe apple, do we get strong aspiration of the P in ripe in a phrase like a ripe apple? No, we don't. It's weak aspiration, if anything, a ripe apple. We don't say a ripe apple. So aspiration is one of the signals that putako or ka is at the beginning of a syllable, or perhaps it might be a word. And so there are various interesting minimal pairs where you have to listen for aspiration to know which is which. We sometimes play around with a phrase like a grey tape, which is a tape coloured grey, a grey tape. And you hear the aspiration of the t, a grey tape. And that's different from a great ape, which is a big monkey, a great ape where we don't have the aspiration. There are other indications as well, which we can look at later. But the, the two are clearly different. English word boundaries are mostly signaled phonetically, and aspiration is one of the ways in which we signal word boundaries. OK, immediately in a word like happy, letter, lucky. Um, Daniel Jones says these are unaspirated. Students sometimes query this because to be honest, it's not true. Happy. We get some aspiration. Slight aspiration. Not strong aspiration. We don't say happy. We say happy. 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 And I suppose, crucially, it seems that speakers of languages like Thai or Hindi, who have these contrasts of aspiration, tend, if forced, to push these into the unaspirated category. Happy. Left. Lucky. And finally, after S, wasp. There's a, there's a wasp on your arm. It's not entirely unaspirated, like in spin. We don't say there's a wasp on your arm. But there's a wasp on your. There's a wasp on your arm. A little bit of aspiration there. So in these positions, it seems to be slightly aspirated. Now we come to the voiced sounds. Point six on the, on the handout. The voice, or sometimes called linis obstruens, are reliably voiced only when between other voiced sounds. So if they're surrounded by vowels, no problem, they're voiced. That is, the vocal folds continue to vibrate. Elsewhere, <coughs> things get more complicated, because the elsewhere, they're usually devoiced there's not actually much vibration of the vocal folds during their production. So we call them leanest and against fortis. We still know that they're leanest, that they're so-called voiced, because there's no aspiration, there's no clipping of the preceding vowel, we'll come to this when we talk about vowels, and they're uttered with less articulatory force. Have I got a picture of this? No, I haven't. 
So uh, let's just think about less articulatory forms. Take the word touch, touch, touch something. That final ch, voiceless, forties, touch, ch, ch, quite energetic. Compare that with the word judge, judge. Now, we don't actually say judge, we say judge, judge. That final is not really voiced, judge, judge. It still leanish though, and we know this because it's articulated very gently, judge, judge. Compare touch, so it's a matter of strength of articulation. We probably achieve this by an adjustment at the glottis, but the glottis, although it isn't actually vibrating, it's still narrowed for the leanest ones. But anyhow, the result is there is a strong distinction between ch and j, even when you get devoicing. OK, at the bottom of the handout, I go through some of the main problems, uh, depending on language. Uh, Chinese have uh, mm. problems because their equivalents of the dega are truly voiceless, whereas ours are sort of devoiced, uh, unaspirated things. Uh, Japanese tend to have problems with final butaka. English words borrowed into Japanese have gemination, doubling. So the English word shop is borrowed as shop, or something like that where the P is doubled. Now, it's wrong to double it in English. In English, we don't go shopping, we go shopping. And the English word bed, to sleep on, borrowed into Japanese as beddo. <laughs> you have to forgive my attempts to pronounce foreign languages. But anyhow, in English, it's bed. It doesn't have this doubling. It's not bed, just bed. Professor Matsuno made the point on Friday that the crucial thing about English consonants is to start them properly. <laughs> Don't worry about the end of them. <laughs> Whereas in many other languages, what's important is to end them <laughs> thoroughly, which is not terribly relevant in English, at least with syllable final ones. OK, aspiration, problem for speakers of Spanish, French, Italian, Greek, Russian, even Dutch, and so on. Uh, excessive aspiration, well, this is a problem really with, it's not such a problem with Chinese or Koreans, if you do very strong aspiration, if you write with a pen instead of a pen, that could sound a bit strange. Fairly distinguish S from Z, this is a problem for Scandinavians and speakers of Spanish, depending on the kind of Spanish, but usually it is, and Italians, it can go either way. Failure to distinguish voiceless and voiced in non-initial position, well, <coughs> we've looked at those in the examples. So that's really the end of this talk for this morning. Thank you very much for your attention, and we'll continue to practice. <laughs>